So thank you so much for joining us today, everyone. Hello. Um, we're so lucky to uh, be here today in conversation uh, for this panel discussion called We Build Consent, Student Leaders on Critical Action Needed for Safer Communities. And like I said, this is a panel discussion attended to bring, intended to bring student voices together from across the country to recognize Consent Awareness Week. My name is Aubriana Snow. I use she and her pronouns. I'm a Mi'kmaq woman located in Treaty 6 territory. Um, I'm the stakeholder relations specialist with Possibility Seeds, and prior to that, I was a student leader here in Alberta, and I'm honored to be moderating this important conversation today. Consent Awareness Week invites people to have thoughtful, affirming, intersectional, and age-appropriate conversations about consent. Responding to rejection, articulating boundaries, respecting bodily autonomy, and active listening are all really valuable life skills. And this week is a significant opportunity to reflect, champion, and celebrate consent as a cornerstone of all relationships, not just intimate ones. Before we begin, I would like to make a quick note on language and accessibility. Attendees can view live captions for this session by clicking on the link in the chat box. You can also listen to this session in French by selecting the French language channel using the interpretation menu. If you're having trouble with anything accessibility related during the session, um, we do have Laura online. Please let her know and she will be happy to assist you. It's been such a privilege for the team at Possibility Seeds to work with activists and organizers from all corners of the country in making Consent Awareness Week a reality. So I'd like to say a brief word about Possibility Seeds as well. Um, if I could get the next slide, please. Thank you. So Possibility Seeds is a Canadian social change consultancy dedicated to gender justice, equity, and inclusion. We believe safer and more equitable workplaces, organizations, and institutions are possible. Next slide, please. Possibility Seeds leads the Courage to Act project, a multi-year national initiative to address and prevent gender-based violence on Canadian campuses. It builds on key recommendations within Possibility Seeds landmark Courage to Act report. With a national network of experts, Courage to Act develops tools, resources, and strategies as the first national collaborative of its kind. Our project is made possible through generous support and funding from the Department for Women and Gender Equality, or WAGE, from the Federal Government of Canada. Next slide, please. Okay. So I'd like to acknowledge that this work is taking place on and across the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations. The treaty I'm, or the territory I'm currently on is the homeland of the Cree, Métis, Blackfoot, Nakota Sioux, and many other Indigenous nations. This territory was the subject of Treaty 6, which was an agreement between the Crown and Cree, Assiniboine, and Ojibwe leaders to peaceably share and care for the resources in this land. European settlers broke this agreement, and over the past two centuries, Canada's colonization process has enacted systemic, systematic genocide against the Indigenous peoples of this land. We see these acts of colonization and genocide continuing today in the forced sterilization of Indigenous women, the epidemic of missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit people, the overrepresentation of Indigenous children in care, the criminalization of Indigenous people resulting in overrepresentation in prisons, and environmental racism and land theft of Indigenous territories. As we come together to respond to experiences of gender-based violence, we have to acknowledge this as a decolonial struggle. The two cannot be separated. Supporting decolonization and Indigenous sovereignty is critical to working towards a culture of consent and accountability. We honor and take direction from the experience and wisdom of Indigenous survivors, activists, frontline workers, writers, educators, healers, and artists. Today, we will take action by inviting attendees to recognize the rightful owners of the land they're on by visiting nativeland.ca, and that will also be linked in the chat. And we will also share the calls for justice within Reclaiming Power in Place, the final report of the National Inquiry. Next slide, please. Thank you. So this work can be challenging and many of us may have our own experiences of survivorship and of supporting those we love and care about who've experienced gender-based violence. A gentle reminder here to always be attentive to our well-being as we engage in these difficult conversations and do anything that you may need to to take care of yourself during this time. You can visit the self-care section of our Skillshare webpage or visit the self-care room by visiting the link in the chat. 
Now we will move to the next slide for a video by the Honorable Marcy Ian, Minister for Women and Gender, Equal Women and Gender Equality and Youth. Thank you. cannot think of a better way to kick off Consent Awareness Week than with so many remarkable young people sharing experiences, sharing ideas, and solutions on an important topic that continues to impact far too many young people right across Canada, gender-based violence on campus. As the summer comes to an end and students head back to school, what should be an exciting time for young people can also be a time of heightened risk. Consider these troubling statistics. About one in 10 female students were sexually assaulted in a post-secondary setting in 2019. Most of them go unreported. In fact, just 8% of female students who were sexually assaulted spoke up about the incident to someone affiliated with their school. Ending gender-based violence on campus and in our country is a top priority for me and a top priority for our government. Everyone, everyone has the right to learn and work in a safe and secure environment, free from harassment and sexual violence. We're working with students like you, institutions like yours, and with gender equality champions from across the country, like Farrakhan and Possibility Seeds, to put in place a plan to keep young women, girls, and 2SLGBTQI plus people studying at post-secondary institutions safe. This week, I'm excited to announce that we will be launching, it's not just a gender-based violence youth awareness campaign, as you scroll through your timelines, keep a look out for the hashtag, it's not just, and continue the conversation because a key component to ending gender-based violence is awareness and education. And to get this right, it is absolutely critical that your voices lead the way. So events like today's serve as an important space for frank and honest conversation, and a catalyst for much needed change. A huge thank you to Possibility Seeds for your partnership, and thank you to each and every student here today for doing your part to build safer campuses in your communities. I wish you a productive day. I wish you a day of honest conversation. So we want to extend our sincere gratitude to the Honorable Marcy Ian, Minister for Women and Gender Equality and Youth, for taking the time to provide us with those inspiring reflections. Also, am I able to get the next slide, please? Thank you. So for the way the uh, panel discussion will be structured today, all panelists will have the opportunity to introduce themselves and then I will pose an initial and closing question to the entire panel. And then in the central portion, panelists will have the opportunity to discuss amongst each other and ask each other questions um, of uh, their, their own interests. So we'll uh, get into that portion here right away. So I would like to facilitate some introductions of panelists. So I'm going to call on folks to introduce themselves. Um, and again, uh, just name, pronouns, institution, and anything you would like folks here to know about you today. And we'll start with Daisha, who is the first person I see on my screen. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for coming, coming out. Um, my name is Daisha Lopi, pronouns she, her. 
And uh, I'm currently a third year journalism student at Toronto Metropolitan University, um, but I'm also a freelance journalist. In fact, uh, I have an article coming out in the West End Phoenix, which is an independent publication about some of the issues that youth are facing um, uh, today. So definitely look out for that. And I'm so grateful to be here today. Thank you so much, Daisha. We're honored to have you here today. Let's go to Maya. Hi, I'm Maya. My pronouns are Elle in French or she, her in English. I am a visual arts student um, in the CEGEP of the Joliette and also president of the Fédération étudiante collégiale du Québec. Our federation represents 78,000 CEGEP students from 27 different student associations in Quebec. And we're very, very happy to be participating in this um, Consent Awareness Week uh, this year. Thanks so much, Maya. It's awesome to have you here. Let's go to Ariana. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ariana Chartrand. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I am a fourth year early childhood education bachelor student at Capilano University, which is located on the unceded and ancestral lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil waututh nations. Uh, colonially known as North Vancouver, and I'm actually calling in from campus today. I also chair the Alliance of BC Students, which represents student associations and student unions on the Lower Mainland, but also on the island as well. So thank you all so much for having me here today. Thanks, Ariana, for joining us. Let's go to Isabel. Um, hi, folks. Uh, my name is Isabel Ojeda. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am a fourth year political science student at the Memorial University of Newfoundland and Labrador, and I'm also the executive director of campaigns for the MUN Students Union. Um, I'm calling in today from the unceded traditional homelands of the Beothic and the Mi'kmaq, colonially known as St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador. Honored to be here today. Honored to have you, Isabel. Thank you. And thank you so much, everyone, for your thoughtful introductions. I'm feeling really blessed to be able to share in this space with uh, such great minds today. And I'd like to begin with my first general question. And this is for everyone. Um, I'm curious what consent means to you and how it intersects with your daily life and your lived experiences. And also, I know that this is a little bit of a, a difficult topic and, and difficult conversations around um, gender-based violence prevention. So I'm wondering in particular, what about Consent Awareness Week brings you joy or makes you hopeful? And I will just drop that question in the chat as well. Um, I would like to direct that question first. We'll start back at Daisha. Thank you. Yeah, sounds good. Um, I think I just wanna start off by saying like, consent awareness is so important. Um, I think, at least in my experience, a lot of the time, the conversation was about protection, protect yourself, like, um, you know, keep yourself safe. But I, I, until recently, I never really was educated on exactly what um, consent is and, and what it looks like. And so I think conversations like these um, provide a great foundation um, for like blossoming individuals, whether you're in university or younger or whatever point in your life um, to have a great foundation for like a way to navigate the world and relationships with other people. And so in that, what brings me joy about Consent Awareness Week is um, one, just seeing so many people doing this work in so many different ways. And then also seeing um, the reception of it uh, by different communities and their engagement and their um, determination to ensure that awareness about consent, you know, increases and is also implemented in, in, in practical ways in one's day-to-day -day life. So I think that's what it is for me. Yeah, thanks so much, Daisha. I think that uh, that kind of daily aspect of consent is really important, and I think a lot of people overlook that. So yeah, thank you for those reflections. I'd like to pass that question to Ariana. Thank you, Abriana. Um, I was actually thinking about this a lot recently, and I mentioned earlier, I am an early childhood educator, so I work a lot with children and youth, and I have begun to notice consent as this daily commitment and practice, and it shows up in so many different ways. It shows up in how we um, comfort each other and how we, we protect each other and how we show, you know, many, many different things, and, and I see how young we start to internalize either consent and having that practice and honoring it or how we 
we project and ignore. And, you know, this is where a lot of these problems grow and develop if they're not addressed very, very early on. And so I, I genuinely see consent as this, this huge commitment, but it's not something new. And it's, it is concerning that so many people are having this conversation so late because it does show up so, so early. I am, however, very hopeful, you know, seeing a space like this where all of us who are so committed to having these conversations across the country are continuing because we can't really change any of the systems and institutions that are currently not keeping us safe unless we're talking about consent. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Ariana. That's such an important point on that institutional change piece. I'd like to hear from Maya on this question. Yeah, I was talking with other student leaders last week about this, and we were talking about how within our circles of, of the student movement or with other student leaders, we're used to talk about consent, but when we exit these circles, it really isn't the same. So having a week like this is very encouraging because we, we like we're able to witness a, a broader conversation about it. And it is very encouraging for the next few years when there will be other consent awareness week and that the, the conversation will be much larger within Canada and within um, student student um, communities also. But yeah, we're, I'm, I feel like it is very encouraging to see these conversations happening outside of our small circles right now. Yeah, likewise, Maya. How about you, Isabel? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, Consent Awareness Week is really important for all of the reasons that the other students said. But I also think, um, like, to add to that as well, I think it's a really great opportunity to kind of hold our governments and our institutions accountable as well. And I think that's something that um, we've really been focusing in on at my campus is the ways that um, how can we both bring awareness to these issues, both to our larger student body, but also have the conversations with, you know, our own, like the offices within the university I go to and within um, like the provincial government um, and, you know, the federal governments as well and the moves that can be made to have, you know, better funding and better practices overall for it. And in terms of what brings me joy or makes me hopeful about it, I mean, I think like the reason why this is so important in general is because I think like everybody here, I would presume knows in some facet or way how prevalent this issue is. And I think having um, having a week dedicated to it really brings that opportunity to kind of bring the community together, especially, I mean, I know um, like so many politicians and things, they love to go on TV and talk about how prevalent this issue is and how upsetting it is and et cetera, et cetera. But I think it can be really difficult when you're a student on a campus experiencing those issues firsthand and not seeing much action happening around them. And so I think the benefit to having a week like this is that it lets students know that they are heard, they are recognized, and there is a community of people who understand what they've gone through and can kind of come together and build the tools towards making um, things better overall. Yeah, thank you, Isabel. I think you all touched on some really amazing, important points. And I think this is such a unique opportunity in terms of Consent Awareness Week being um, really the first kind of initiative of its kind um, across the country. Um, just being able to make space for those conversations, I feel it's so powerful in not only uplifting the voices and opinions of survivors, but also in letting young people know and the coming generation know that we're working hard to build safe spaces for them. And this advocacy work um, has been so rewarding just to see the kind of uptake that folks have done across the country in taking Consent Awareness Week and making it their own and running with it. It's just been really beautiful and rewarding. So that, uh, that really brings me some joy. Um, so I'd like to move on now to the more discussion-oriented portion. Um, I'll pass the floor to Isabel again, as I believe uh, she has a question, and I would just like to remind folks as well that you will be passing between each other for this portion, so I'll pass it over to you, Isabel. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so the question I have is for Ariana. So you were recently a part of the Our Campus, Our Safety Student Leaders Action Plan for institutions and governments to address and prevent sexual violence on campus. This action plan had a really powerful impact. So how can we approach organizations, governments, and those in power with these issues? Why is it important that they care and how do we make them listen? 
Thank you for the question, Isabel. It's a great question and such an important one. Um, so the Alliance of BC Students, one of our pillars of advocacy for years now has been addressing the sexualized and gender-based violence crisis in our post-secondary spaces. Um, and the, the approach we've really taken is any opportunity, any consultation, like budget submissions, lobbying, campaigning, any time we can get, uh, any way we can get time and space with decision makers, like this has been what we've been talking about. It was actually very timely to be part of this Our Campus, Our Safety Plan, because the province of British Columbia is currently going through a, an extensive consultation process to improve our Provincial Sexual Violence and Misconduct Policy Act. And so I've been to several of these consultation meetings and quite literally have sent the link for this action plan that was developed by student leaders time and time again, because the current Provincial Policy Act doesn't define consent. It doesn't define intersectionality. It doesn't uh, define harassment. And so it's very difficult to feel protected by these policies that are so sparse. And so having this document as a, a reference point and to really be able to utilize all of this incredible work that has already been done is really is hopefully gonna support the improvements of our, our provincial specific. Um, it could be way better. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest with you, but uh, I am hopeful that because this document exists and I have been really, really pushing our decision makers to utilize this work. It's done, it's there, it's ready. We just need to make sure that we're incorporating it into what we, we need to do to protect our students over here. All right, I also have a question and I'm going to pose my question to Daisha. And so Daisha, you are a, an incredibly talented journalist who works to create new narratives around healing, justice and liberation. Could you tell us about the power and the importance of writing storytelling? Um, and, you know, in resisting rape culture and creating consent culture. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, and also thank you for the work that, that you were speaking of that you've been doing. Um, I think in terms of like um, my work and what I've been up to, a lot of the time um, things happen to us and we think that it's just us experiencing them or we feel like it's just us, right? And that can be a very isolating, um, an isolating feeling. And, and for me, at least, it, like there's been moments where I felt very powerless. And I think that's also a very hard challenge of, of survivorship as well, feeling so alone. But when we realize we aren't alone, um, not only do we see the power that we have as individuals, but we also see the power that we have as individuals together as a collective and um, I think in order to see the future that that we want um, it's going to take collective effort to to get to that change and so in terms of my work um, I've written personal essays and like memoirs about my experience as a survivor um, and in doing so that has definitely empowered me and instilled co more confidence within me to advocate for myself and my needs and my wishes and desires. Um, but I've noticed it's also empowered others to do the same, whether it's sharing their story once they're ready or becoming more educated on, on consent or like sexual responsibility or like, you know, um, different topics that help keep us safe and, and um, joyful. Um, so there's that as well through my work and, and the power. And I think that is also part of that, that power, like coming together to um, catalyze this change. Uh, and it's definitely an important tool in personal and community healing. I've noticed for myself and also for some of the other people that my story has resonated with. But yeah, personal, personal as a journalist, like writing personal narratives and memoirs, like I, I'm just very much continuing uh, a legacy in my own way, I believe. Like, personal narratives are very much catalysts for change. And the reference I always use is um, Mary Prince, who was an enslaved uh, black woman born in Bermuda, but was shuffled around the uh, Caribbean and um, worked under different enslavers, but she was able to tell her story of being an enslaved black woman and the abuse that she, su she suffered at the time and throughout her life. And that story was very pivotal in um, the British abolition of slavery in 1833. So that's just one example, like there's so many more, but um, yeah, I think 
through my work, it's very much, very much using the power of the personal narrative to disrupt these systems and, and the structures that make us feel shameful about our experience or guilty or, or make us feel powerful and, and reclaiming that power. And so I think that's where, <laughs> I think that's where um, the power of writing and storytelling um, comes up. But thank you for asking and so glad to share. I do also have a question, um, but this question is gonna go towards Maya. Hi Maya. <laughs> um, so my question is like, you've done such incredible work as the president of the FECQ. And so with that and your experience, I want to ask you, what opportunities and constraints uh, do you see for violence prevention, advocacy, um, and in uh, Francophone spaces? Like how can folks support this work? Thanks for your question. Um, I feel like I need to put a bit of context about how um, Quebec has uh, different laws that can um, help prevent and fight against sexual violence on our campus. So uh, like five years ago, there was uh, a big mobilization of student associations around the province and it, it made us um, in Quebec adopt a law that uh, could help prevent and fight against sexual violence on our campus. But like right now it exists, but it still needs improvement in our opinion, because like we, we made a great work of, um, of fighting against it, but there still needs to be improvement in, our, in the way that our institutions are built and how um, the, 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 sorry for <laughs> my English is a bit rusty, um, but I feel like having already a law is really, really great, but it isn't unusual that politicians don't want to do more as they think the issue is over. So that's a bit of a ch challenge because we feel like there still needs to be um, work to be done. And there's uh, an opportunity right now of having uh, a provincial election. So on October 3rd, we'll be voting uh, to see our next government being elected. But we, as students, are um, are raising awareness to candidates to make sure they take it, take it into account for the next four years if they are elected on October 3rd. Um, but politicians need to need to realize that if there still are victims of sexual violence on our camp, to be more uh, work to be done. So I think like looking for solutions will be uh, much needed in the next four years. And um, I feel like I'd really like to hear uh, Isabel talking about mobilization because you're currently director of campaigns for a month, student union. Um, what in inspires your advocacy and what is a campaign or initiative around consent proud of? Um, yeah, thank you so much, Maya. That was such a great answer. And I completely agree um, that there really is uh, a lot of struggle around encouraging politicians to take action, especially when they think that they've done enough on the issue so far. So to answer your question, what inspires my advocacy? Um, so I think, honestly, it's the students themselves and also the realization that we deserve better, we've had better, and kind of encouraging folks to, like, envision that together. And so a campaign um, that we've really been working on on my campus right now is surrounding education. And I promise that this does relate to consent, uh, but I think like we recently had um, in the last year, a massive cut to our, uh, in the provincial gov budget of Newfoundland and Labrador, a massive cut to post-secondary education in the province. And so because of that, um, there was a 22 year tuition freeze on my campus for um, that kept education more affordable and accessible for students. Um, and this was recently reversed with a massive tuition hike coming out of it. And so something that I've been really proud of is the work that we've been doing on my campus to connect this to our other campaigns and really highlight how like issues around education and funding impact us in every facet of life. And so when you know, when the government cuts education and when we have those hikes to tuition, they're not just cutting, they're not just passing those um, cuts to the budget onto students, but they are also cutting funding that can go to, you know, our sexual harassment office. They are cutting funding that can 
tangibly actually impact the lives of students in providing like that trauma-informed harm reductive care we really want to see. And I think there's just a reality that when students are, you know, better off financially, that creates a safer environment all around. So something I'm really proud of is the way that we have been able to kind of connect education to all of the different things that we are seeing on our campus right now because it is so prevalent. And beyond that, I was also a contributor to the Possibility Seize Action Plan, and I'm really proud of the work that we were able to do as student leaders all across the country and holding our governments accountable, because I think that that is so, so important. And they quite legitimately, they hold the money, they hold the power in making that tangible difference on our campuses. And I think, you know, for too long, they haven't been acknowledging that. And so that's really what inspires me in my work is the realization that people in power have um, the opportunity to do more and that, you know, together and with mobilization and organizing, we can really push them to do that work. Thank thanks. You. Yeah, thanks so much, Isabel. Um, if it's okay with folks, I do just have a couple of uh, follow-up questions for some of the answers that were given. Um, I would just like to bounce back to the answer you gave around personal narratives, Daisha. Um, I know that there is such power in um, discussing our personal stories, particularly as it relates to gender-based violence and trauma. Um, I'm, I'm wondering what you see as, I, I guess, the opportunities for, for folks to do that and how, how do you overcome your own barriers to sharing those very personal um, and, and deeply impactful uh, stories as they relate to gender-based violence? What advice would you give for people who are looking to share their stories? Yeah, that's such a great question. And it's something that I think about and struggle with like every day, um, especially in my, in my work and in my practice. Um, for myself, I think the first thing is to really sit down with yourself and make sure that you're ready to share your story or to talk about it. Um, and there's so many different ways that you can do that, right? So first I think is definitely a check-in with self, but then, and I'll speak to some of the ways, then there's a bunch of different ways you can go about that that may suit your capacity to share your story better. So um, I may get the times wrong, but before I even started like writing about, before I wrote the pers this personal essay, um, I went to a support group um, by one of the crisis centers in Toronto. And I think it was like a four week support group. Um, it was uh, with other black women or non-binary um, survivors. And so that was kind of like a stepping stone to being in a place to share my story through my writing in that public way. Um, and so like finding that space is really important. So like there's that space and that could just be it, you know, maybe you're speaking in a safe space with other people who have experienced the same things as you. Um, then there was like the writing, there was a lot of like journal di diary writing, talking to trusted close friends and family um, and then panels, for example. So I think what's really important is to check in with yourself first and think about how you want your story told if you're ready and if you want to tell, to tell your story. Um, I think you had asked something else in that question. Could you just remind me towards the end, maybe? Unless I've answered it. Um, I feel like that was a pretty good answer. Um, just wondering about, I guess, uh, outlets for folks and sharing their story. I mean, uh, not everybody is a writer. So what, what would you get? What advice would you give to folks who are uh, maybe not so inclined in that way, but would like to share their stories? Yeah, it's definitely so like I feel like once you check in with yourself and you kind of have an idea of, of your your passions and your likes and, and your dislikes, um, like there's so many, that's what's kind of beautiful about it. There's so there's no one way to tell to tell your story. And and I think that's an important point as well. Like um, there's no one way to tell a story and there shouldn't be one story. So whether it's like arts based, like you're doing collages or whether you're doing like speaking and it doesn't even have to be as formal as a panel, it can be speaking to a trusted friend, speaking to, um, you know, family members, because what was really interesting for me as I was writing and researching and just like diving deeper into my experiences um, the people that I spoke to also had similar experiences to me, you know, and um, sad, but also empowering in a sense to know that, like, it's not just me, there's other people going through this, and they're also, like, excelling or doing their best to, 
to be okay uh, at the end of the day, or even not be okay, but just to be here, you know what I mean, and exist. So, so there's so many different avenues. And I think it's just up to the person to decide which one suits their preferences and the way that they want their want to express themselves and their story. That's really beautiful, Daisha. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to swing back on uh, some of the responses you gave as well, Isabel. Um, I know as a post-secondary student activist, uh, a lot of the times we're told um, that the issues we're advocating for do come back to funding and that a lot of this is out of the hands of the institution. So I would like to know what you think the institution can do to better support survivors regardless of funding. And I would welcome other folks to jump in on this as well if they have some additional thoughts too. Absolutely. So, I mean, to respond to that as well, I think a lot of times this comes back to a budget. I mean, it really is just a value document where you allocate money within an institution shows what you are valuing more. And I think a lot of times when like sexual harassment offices and, you know, the like are underfunded all across this country in so many post-secondary institutions. And what that shows me is that the institutions aren't prioritizing that work and they aren't ensuring that, um, you know, having the kind of care that students are begging for and need isn't being prioritized by our institutions. So on the first hand, I think it is really about pushing institutions and governments into allocating more funding. But I think going beyond the funding, it really is about working together on ensuring your messaging um, is hitting as many students as efficiently and productively and with as much care as possible. And so I think one thing that I've definitely seen is that oftentimes due to, you know, funding issues and lack of staff and different things, like we will have um, like consent education geared as a one size fits all message. And so what I would really like to see is the realization that what we need out of consent education looks different depending on the student's background, depending on where they're coming from, et cetera. So we really have like, um, like international students, indigenous students, racialized students, queer students, trans students, they all need different messaging geared towards them. And I also think that having this one kind, like this kind of message of a one size fits all doesn't acknowledge where the most harm is coming from. And we really have to be reckoning with, you know, men specifically and how we can adhere to that. So I think working with your student union is something that is underutilized a lot by, um, you know, different offices within the institution on how that messaging can look and the realization that students have a lot to offer to this education um, in general. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that collaboration piece is so important, is so important, Isabel. Thank you for uh, pointing that out. I'm wondering, uh, Ariana, Maya, and Daisha, if you have any thoughts on that. I think Isabel spoke to so many really important points. I would emphasize getting involved with other students who are working towards making post-secondary more equitable and to making their campuses safer. I like cannot stress enough or emphasize enough how many opportunities there are to connect with folks who are doing this work. And, and it is really reassuring because it can often feel so isolating if you feel like you are trying to single-handedly sometimes change systems and institutions that were designed to cause you harm. Uh, so really connecting with folks who are doing that work. Um, and I, I really do think it translates and it becomes aware to the institutions. And once they start noticing many, many voices and students who are sort of on the precipice of getting involved or really become engaging, you actually start to, to see sort of the path that you can take to make sure that things are getting done. At least that's what I found super helpful. Yeah, that's so true, Ariana. Thank you. I think uh, that collective power is really at the core of, of all of this work, really. So yeah, thank you all so much, uh, everyone, for such rich and meaningful responses and, and such a great conversation so far. Um, I'd like to pose another question to you all, um, and then I think we'll make some space for folks in the audience to ask a couple of questions. So I'm going to do this in the same style that I did the first question. So I'll just ask and then I'll direct it to each of you to answer. So Consent Awareness Week is meant to engage the whole community, and I'm wondering what are some meaningful ways that each of us can advocate for and promote consent in our daily lives? I'll, uh, I'll swing this question to Ariana first. Sure. Um, and 
This is a good question too. And I've been having this conversation, not just in this particular avenue of advocacy, but all of the advocacy I do. And it's about amplifying existing voices. It's about recognizing that there are folks who've been doing this work for forever. And, you know, what, in what ways can I utilize our, our platform at the ABCS or my, my space and my time as one of the executives at my student union to really amplify their work? Um, a lot of it does come from, you know, my lived experience and the folks that I, I connect with, but the, the best way I've seen to do daily action is to see what's happening. How can I best support those who are doing this and everything I can do to make sure that um, their, their jobs and their lives are a little bit easier. Uh, recently, we, we submitted a consultation for the funding review, and a lot of it is to just better support those working better support those on the ground, better support those who are exuding like incredible amounts of emotional labor and are under supported, under resourced, underfunded. And so finding ways to support those already doing this has been really, really important in my daily advocacy as the student leader. Thanks, Ariana. That's such a huge piece in my mind is just empowering folks who have already been doing this work. Because as we know, particularly in Black, Indigenous, um, a person of color to us LGBTQ plus communities, this work has been going on for a really long time. And it's really important to uplift those voices and make sure that people who have been doing this labor feel supported. Because I feel so often institutions uh, feel that these things aren't going on and they just need to walk in there and start doing it. But that's so not the case so often. Um, so thank you for that. I, I would like to pass this question to Daisha. Yeah, I think that point that Ariana mentioned is so important. Um, like, even in my own work, at first I thought I like it, it felt novel to me, but um, I realized like no, all the books that I've been reading by Black women writers, even the people in my life as well, um, doing that work and speaking, like I'm really by doing this, I'm honoring myself, yes, but I'm also honoring a, a legacy of a lot of hard work. Um, and a lot of advocacy. And even to um, the point I think Isabel had mentioned um, about funding, like for me, it's just it's amazing to see people do the work with like next to nothing, you know, and, and try to like, of course they deserve funding and they should have funding, but like that's not an excuse when we're seeing people do the hard grassroots work and, and getting it done and supplementing that lack. Um, and so, but I guess more specific to, to my writing, um, like, I think my writing in terms of this concept, like in terms of consent, um, in terms of like uh, gender-based violence, like very much focused on the practical ways and that we can apply these principles and values behind the larger concepts we're speaking about. I think a lot of times, especially in the in institutional realm, there's a lot of dissonance, like saying one thing and then showing another thing or doing another thing with, with your actions. And so the question that comes up in my daily life and in my writing is like, how do we make sure our intentions like match our actions or like our actions are a result of um, our intentions? So like if, if our intention is to advocate for and promote consent, like what, how are our actions matching that? For me specifically as a black woman survivor, like in my day to day, um, promoting consent can look like from other people, it's like, ask me before you repost or post or use pictures of me um, or my work, you know, before you do that. Um, when I'm at like a FET and there's a lot of like skin to skin contact or people just dancing with other people, it's like, I check in with others, others check in with me. Can I dance on you? Like, I'd like to dance on you. How'd you feel about that? You know? Um, so there's no miscommunication and, and no one feels unsafe and gets hurt even simply just quickly like you know a friend sharing an experience with me um and with my knowledge kind of extending that knowledge to to them to let them know like maybe this wasn't right like this is how you could go about dealing with this but of course let me know what you would want your next steps to be you know so I think very much emphasis on asking um before before doing things and ensuring that your intent um, if your intent is to promote consent, advocate for it, matches your actions in your day-to-day in your -day life. 
Thanks so much, Daisha. Those are some really amazing points. And I particularly like that application to um, just getting out in the world and interacting in all kinds of different spaces. Uh, like you said, it, it definitely doesn't stop at the bedroom or any kinds of situations with uh, sexual overtones. It, it can be between friends, it can be between family. Um, it really is uh, just very, very varied in a lens through which to see things. Um, I'll pass this question now to Maya. Thank you. I feel like um, this question is important because we have power as student leaders to to act. And I feel like as a student leader that um, has contacts in different regions and different uh, institutions, a, a great way of promoting um, consent in like our daily lives is to create spaces for discussion. Like right now, we do have this opportunity with possibility seeds, but not everyone has these kinds of opportunities. And um, so I feel like having these discussions and spaces to, to discuss with people from different regions makes you ask yourself questions how on your on your campus you can act differently um, with your um, administration. Because um, if, if a campus has acted differently and it worked, how can you do the same or do different to make it work in your situation? But I feel like we with these contacts and with um, these these um, student leadership positions, we have uh, the responsibility the responsibility to create these spaces for people that that aren't um, in these kinds of positions. Yeah. Yeah, I think you hit a really important point there, Maya, and I, I would like to come back to that after we finish this question, because I really think there's something important there. Um, in the meantime, I'll pass this to Isabel. Yeah, thank you so much. And everybody had such great answers to this. I think um, when we talk about engaging the whole community, what that means to me as well is making sure like as an organizer and as an executive of the student union that I'm putting in the work to make sure that I'm properly delegating responsibilities and making sure that the movements and the work that we do are going to be sustainable after my time is done. Because I think like the reality of the situation as well is that with like my role on the student union, and I'm sure like others on the call will relate to this, is so comprehensive that I have to cover so many different things at the same time. And I think the part of what makes Consent Awareness Week and other initiatives so great is the fact that it encourages you to really foster those skills in other folks who, you know, have different experiences than my own and are doing such great works in different facets of our, you know, post-secondary community and really making sure that their work is being highlighted and improved in that, like, a large part of my role is just making sure that the work and actions and initiatives and campaigns of other people are being um, supported and reflected and making sure that, you know, the amplified. Um, and I think, like, to advocate for and promote consent in our daily lives, that really means knowing when it's time to pass the mic and encourage other people to kind of take center stage there. And that's a lot of what I try to do in my work. Thanks so much, Isabel. And thank you everyone for uh, your really thoughtful answers to this question. I feel like I'm learning so much today and it's such a privilege to be in conversation with all of you. Um, I'd like to make some space for audience questions. So for those of you in the audience, um, you do have that Q&A function. So do feel free to drop a question in there. I know we've got a couple already. So the first question um, I would like to direct to you folks is how do I talk about consent with children? Um, and, and I know uh, we might have a few perspectives on that, but I, I would like to specifically direct this uh, question first to Ariana, because I know she does have that child and youth care background, and then uh, maybe other folks can jump in if they have uh, additions. Absolutely. Thank you, Ariana. And I think this is such a, an important question. And, you know, I, I get asked this question a lot, actually. And the, the quick response is talk about consent, period. Um, I find often what folks where they feel discomfort is the idea that, you know, children are too young to have these conversations. I need to protect them. This isn't appropriate. And the reality is if you're thinking that way, you're thinking about a very specific type of child. The reality is, is that there are many children who need to have these conversations to keep themselves safe. And the reality is that if you don't have these conversations, you're actually just perpetuating the harm that is happening 
to children, particularly from racialized, marginalized, and you know, often Black, Indigenous, queer, uh, trans backgrounds. And so it's, it really is our responsibility as adults and as leaders and as educators in particular, if we do want to keep our community safe, that includes having these conversations because as uncomfortable as they are, the, it's a practice. And I, I kind of spoke to that earlier. It's a, you practice consent. And the earlier we start practicing it, the less stigma there is against it, the less weirdness, the less, you know, it just becomes the, the norm. And it really should be because the, the easiest thing to do is if you want to hug a child, ask them if it's okay. And I think oftentimes people forget how little acts like that every single day provide bodily autonomy and provide respect and really um, encourage and embolden children to who know themselves best. And so I believe just having those conversations in general is a really, really good start, but to make sure that, you know, the families are involved, the children themselves are involved. And I think often that's something that's overlooked. Such good points there, Ariana. Um, does anybody else have any additions on teaching consent to kids? Uh, I would just like emphasize Ariana's point. It's so, so important. Like, especially for me, I know, like in my family, it was always about like, I want to protect you, we're going to keep you safe. But then by not educating your child at a young age about consent and, and showing them what it looks like, um, again, like what Ariana had said, you're, you're kind of just perpetuating that same harm. And you're kind of just doing the opposite of, of what you're intending to do. And um, even in that, I think too, like, there's also something like an inner inter uh, generational aspect to add to that right where it's like you know my parents weren't educated on what consent was and so they didn't know how to speak to me about it you know and so now I'm doing the work um, of educating myself on, on what it is and what it looks like and how to put it into practice so hopefully one day if I do have kids or even just um, people younger than me in my life you know I can pass 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 that on so I thought what Ariana said was so spot on, um, especially for me coming from like um, a racialized, a racialized home, a racialized background. Yeah, thank you so much, Daisha. Um, I feel like that intergenerational aspect is a really big piece and it actually ties into a few of the other questions we're getting. Um, so I see two questions in, uh, in the log here. And one is, do students know what consent is either in theory and or practically? And the other is, did you get sexual health education growing up? And I <laughs> have a lot to say on these pieces. So I, if it's okay with folks, I, I, I would like to uh, sound off for a minute on that. And then I'll uh, pass it along for other folks to put in their two cents about uh, the knowledge that students have around consent and the knowledge that we were given growing up. So I think, um, I, th I think it was either Daisha or Isabel hit on this point about um, people not really having access to broader consent education in the generations above us. And really and truly, you don't know what you don't know. And I think, uh, as you said, uh, Daisha, coming from an indigenous household, I know that people in my community, these resources were taken from us. At one point, uh, sexuality and uh, sexual health, gender, uh, all of these topics would have been given to us by elders and, and taught in a good way. And now uh, our communities don't have any of those resources. And so, uh, our, our youth really depend on the public education system to provide this knowledge. Um, so I, I think there's something to be said for the fact that you just don't know what you don't know and that education is really a privilege and particularly around consent and sexuality. It is a human right and yet we're still failing uh, young people in this department. And like looking back on my own experience of sexuality education, it was extremely abstinence focused extremely pregnancy focused, extremely STI prevention focused. Um, not once did I hear the word consent as it related to sex until my first year of university. Um, so that's one way I think we're, we're really failing youth and um, to give consent education more broadly to folks who are younger and to really um, lay the foundations in terms of 
national and provincial standards on consent education is really the piece that's missing because this is um, such essential life-changing knowledge. Um, so that's uh, my two cents on that. And I will just reiterate the questions for folks. The questions were, do students know what consent is in theory or practice? And did you get sexual health education growing up? Um, I know that was a touchy one for me. So if anybody else wants to hop in on that, that would be lovely. I have a couple of things to say just about the latter part about re receiving sexual education in school. And I went to many schools and, you know, some of the things I was taught was that I had to cover my shoulders. I had to cover my stomach and that I had to take measures to protect myself instead of having conversations about consent with everyone. And so uh, clearly that causes a lot of harm. Right. And that's uh, a shift. We're actively trying to shift the way we approach that. And I, I know so many teachers who are fighting decades and decades of this approach and are really trying to reintroduce what is very much needed and what we're seeing a little bit more in post-secondary education, but we need to see it a lot earlier. Um, and it kind of connects to the question that had been asked earlier about what can we do? And I think for folks, particularly if it's with youth, is demand this of your, your institution, your public school, your children have a right to have access to this education and sometimes a little bit of pressure from the outside. If you don't have that knowledge yourself, they should be getting it from their schools. The resources are there, the teachers are there, and sometimes there's that resistance just out of practice and habit because it is a big shift, even from when I was going through the school system. Um, so yeah, I, I received very little sexual education is the answer to that, but I, I am seeing a change. It is hopeful. But I do know that that added pressure coming externally from families, from communities, from whoever is really, really helpful because there is still a lot of resistance. Yeah, thanks so much, Ariana. I, I think uh, I don't want to speak for anyone, but I know uh, a lot of us on the call may share those experiences in terms of uh, the dress code and, and the personal responsibility being put on students to prevent violence. I, I know we're coming up on time. Uh, there is just one more question in uh, the chat that I would like to address. Um, how can men become more engaged in preventing gender-based violence? It's unfair to me that the majority of this kind of work is led by women who are disproportionately the victims of gender-based violence. Would anyone like to chime in on that one? Um, I think my immediate, I'm, I'm not fully sure if this question is like um, asking, I'll just, I'll answer it and, and hopefully it touches on what they asked. I think in terms of men getting engaged um, in this work, I think the first thing um, to point towards what Ariana had said is, and I think Isabel, I think everyone had mentioned this, is like, no, when it's time to pass over the mic and when it's also time to support other people you don't necessarily have to be front and center to be doing the work you can also find ways to to support the work that people are doing but i think in that um some ways some foundational ways that that men can support in this work is by implementing the principles behind consent in their day-to-day -day lives um, and making sure that they're also pushing for the people around them to also do this work. Um, I remember, I'll share an experience as an example, and I can't, again, can't speak for anyone else, but I'm sure other people may have experienced this as well. I remember something happened um, while at a bar with friends and I, and I had brought up the experience to a male friend who was there. And I was like, you know, we would have really appreciated if you, you could have spoken out on our behalf or maybe stepped in, you know? And the response was very much like deflecting, like, well, that person was drunk and like, I don't really know them that well. And so I think part of, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say it's unfair, at least in my, in my opinion, that women are doing this work because it, uh, women and non-binary and people of the queer community are doing this work um, or heading this work because it does disproportionately um, impact us. But I think for sure, like there is responsibility on 
the side of men and that that can even simply as look like having a conversation with your friend who's who's um doing this harm you know because if i have a conversation with them the situation might the outcome of the situation might look a lot different than if you speak with them you know what i mean so i think there's very much like um groundwork everyday hard work that can be done um and i think that needs to needs to happen first and i think yes it would be great to be able to share this labor but i think that is one appropriate way that it can be done thanks so much daisha i think you really hit um all all of the key takeaways for men getting involved in the movement there um i know we are now over time and ariana had to run so i will quickly close laura if you could pull up the closing slide that would be wonderful Okay, and I just want to thank all of the panelists again for your time today. This was such a wonderful experience and it's such a privilege to be able to learn from you all. And I really want to thank everyone who attended today as well. Um, thank you for being a part of Centering the Voices of Students and Survivors for Consent Awareness Week. And I want you to remember that the momentum of Consent Awareness Week has to continue. There are so many ways you can take action. If you want your government or institution at any level to proclaim Consent Awareness Week, you can visit Possibility C ca slash caw and check out our shareables folder we've got some letters in there that you can draft your institution to your political representatives um, you can also take action by posting on social media about consent awareness week or simply having a conversation about consent with somebody you care about um, i think it's really important to remember that this work toward building consent culture happens together and we really need your action now to ensure that we can build a safer future for everyone so again thank you all so much for attending today um, and do take care. Thank you.